Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the coffee break to uh, session three, a further DeVos style arrangement. I think by now we're all very accustomed to this uh, very encouraging way of conducting sessions. This panel will draw our attention to the magnitude of private international law expanding in the realms of international commercial and finance law, drawing on previous and ongoing work of the Hague Conference in this field. But before I hand over to the moderator, Professor Fentiman, um, just a very uh, brief um, note that we will experiment with a so-called audience engagement tool. So if I could ask those of you who want to participate in that to have your smartphones ready to go on Wi-Fi and open a URL or just a web page, uh, a website. Uh, we will give you a URL that you can dial into and a code, and we will ask you later on to vote on a question. Uh, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, more information to that will come. It is very simple and straightforward. I hand over to Professor Fentiman to take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to add my own words of welcome to you all to this session. I should begin by saying that I and all the members of my panel are very conscious of the responsibility that we have today because our session is immediately before lunch. So we understand that a prompt conclusion to our proceedings um, is going to be necessary. Um, I wonder if uh, I might uh, briefly uh, introduce the members of the panel, although I think it's fair to say that none of them needs any introduction. Uh, but um, if I may start um, here with Professor Francisco Garcia Martin. Uh, on my immediate right is Professor Mercedes Albernoz. On my immediate left is Sir William Blair. Uh, and further down, uh, we have David Goddard. Uh, further down, we have uh, an addition to our panel. Uh, so we're going slightly off-piste, as it were, uh, uh, in the shape of the well-known barrister Christopher Ward. Uh, and at the um, far end, uh, we have Professor Jose Marino Rodriguez. Um, we're going to adopt the following pattern. Uh, each of my colleagues uh, will simply give um, a short presentation. Uh, and I should say that we have collaborated to the extent that there will be no overlap between these. In fact, there will be very subtle synergies, if I may use the fashionable word. Um, so each of them will present in order. Uh, then uh, I will um, invite each of my colleagues to comment briefly uh, on, the, uh, um, on the presentations um, of other colleagues, and then we can um, throw things open Davos style to the floor. And you may or may not wish to use the fashionable electronic device, uh, which um, Thomas has spoken of. Uh, so perhaps we can just go in the order that's on the uh, sheet, and um, I can ask Professor Albornoz if she would like to begin. Well, I, I would like to uh, thank the Hague Conference for having invited me to, to be here. And I have two invitations for you, for the panel, and the audience. It's to go to uh, menti.com and use this code 321390. And let's um, experiment together if we can uh, use technology to interact. So my, my presentation is going to, uh, to deal with legal certainty for contracts in an increasingly connected world. So my second invitation is to imagine. Uh, I want you to imagine that we are, or that you are, a Swedish private, private limited company registered and established in Stockholm, Sweden, that developed and operates an application allowing presenters to interact with their audience through smartphones. And you offer different service levels. 
Apart from the very basic version of the application to which you allow access for free, you offer several paid versions with special features often used by companies for marketing purposes. Your services are hosted in the US. They are web-based and your customers are spread all around the world. They can access and use the app from Santa Fe in Argentina, from Mexico City, from Hong Kong, um, or from wherever they are, provided they have access to the internet. Your activity exposes you and your customers to legal uncertainty. In the event of a dispute, where would you be able to sue your customer? And which law would be applied? So uh, thanks to access to new information and, and communication technology tools, companies or individuals are closer than ever to the possibility of entering into international or cross-border transactions. And when ICT developments come into play, thinking especially about the internet, legal certainty is very likely to diminish because when this happens, it is quite difficult to find an adequate connecting factor to link a legal relationship to one jurisdiction or legal system or another. So private international law is called here to play a relevant role, and so is the Hague Conference as the World Organization for Cross-Border Cooperation in Civil and Commercial Matters. And private international law relies on the principle of party autonomy, allowing choice of court and choice of law agreements as one of the available means to improve legal certainty and predictability. My presentation will focus on the work performed by the Hague Conference in the field of party autonomy, and it will try to identify some challenges which can be seen as opportunities for the near future. So first we have the choice of court convention. It is in force since uh, October, uh, October 2015, and it binds the European Union, European countries, Mexico, and Singapore. But it was also signed by the US, China, Montenegro, and Ukraine. Based on the principle of party autonomy, the convention provides strength to exclusive choice of court agreements by reinforcing the positive effect of granting jurisdiction to the chosen court of a contracting state, and also the negative effect on, on behalf of any other country, uh, of, of the courts of any other contracting states that were not chosen. And also, it ensures recognition or enforcement of a judgment given by the chosen court, except when one of the limited grounds of refusal is met. We consider that this convention uh, makes an important contribution to legal certainty in the field of international commerce. But we think that this contribution or this positive effect could be fostered if two challenges are overcome. So first of all, an awareness. What do we mean by an, an awareness? Uh, we, we can build a bridge here with, with, the, with the preceding panel. Sometimes people are not aware of the, content, of the existence of an instrument and of the content of the functioning of that instrument. And this happens quite frequently, at least in, in our uh, Latin American countries. And, and then there's also uh, an issue with the geographical concentration. Uh, yesterday we were talking about the Eurocentric view of the Hague Conference. And, and I think that uh, here we have a, a huge opportunity to try to, uh, to extend the convention geographically and, for instance, trying to uh, having more involvement from countries of the African region, of Asia, of Latin America too. And in talking about Latin America, I would like to mention that uh, a couple of years ago, the American Association of Private International Law 
approved and adopted a set of principles for transnational access to justice. And those principles embrace the party's autonomy to choose the forum for the dispute. And another instrument I would like to, to talk about is the mm, 2015 principles on choice of law in international commercial contracts. The cornerstone of this instrument is freedom of choice. And it's stated like this, a contract is, is governed by the law chosen by the parties. But uh, something new or in, especially interesting in this instrument is that the law chosen by the parties can not only be the law of a state, but also rules of law that are generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of rules. So from the Latin American perspective, and um, Jose Moreno, my friend Jose Moreno, is going to enter into that deeply in a few minutes, but what I would just like to say is that uh, the Inter-American Convention on the Law Applicable to International Contracts uh, adopted in 1994 in the OAS has had an important influence in uh, the drafting of the Hague principles. And then the principles were already taken as a model for the Paraguayan uh, law on this topic. What are the challenges we can identify here? Well, once again, an awareness. This is a quite new instrument, well, a really new instrument, so uh, it, it needs to be disseminated. People need to, to know it exists, to see and understand its advantages, and be ready to adopt it. I mean, uh, mm, people who are entering into contracts, or companies, more or less, who are entering into contracts, but also judges, arbitrators, and uh, the legal community in general. And then there, there's also a challenge with, with the topic of overlapping between different instruments um, that were adopted in different regional or universal settings. So here we have an opportunity to work together, and Jose Moreno is going to talk about that specifically and giving more details. So I will leave that to my friend Jose. And then there's another challenge, which is to identify new possible topics that could be addressed in the future as part of the work of the Hague Conference. And here is uh, when I, I want to ask you to participate um, because I, I have this question for all of us. Which of these topics may benefit from a private international law instrument? And I put some options, some proposed options related in some way or another to international commerce. And those options are artificial intelligence, cloud computing, smart contracts, technology integrated dispute resolution, and personal data protection. So please vote. You have uh, up to uh, five options. If you, if you want to participate, you are invited. We have 19, 20. <laughs> Who else wants to participate? Uh, it would be interesting to see, well, First of all, we have 0% uh, for none of them. That, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's good news. So, okay, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that here, this is an experiment. You, I, I, I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> so, uh, I think that fr from, from the result, we, we, can, we can see here th there is food for thought for the panel and also for the Hague Conference when, when trying to choose new topics to deal with. Oh, okay, there is 1% for none of them. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> diversity of thought. It's good to know. So, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Christophe. <laughs> Okay, so, so this is, a, as I said, an exper a new experience, and, and I think it, it might be interesting to, to see what, what we can take out from here then. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the next slide, but, but you can keep on voting. <laughs> so just to conclude, if we go back to our initial exercise of considering that we are a Swedish company facing legal uncertainty in a cross-border setting, 
we could also figure that we are called Mentimeter and that we passed contract with the Hague Conference of Private International Law for its Hong Kong event that we suggested and the HCCH accepted to grant jurisdiction to the city court of Stockholm and to choose the laws of Sweden as applicable law. This would be a suitable way, at least for us, to improve legal certainty in our international contract concluded and performed online in the context of an increasingly connected world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and can I say, in the manner of American game shows to the audience, thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs> very well. Sir William Blair. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, it's uh, a huge uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. I know at the back it's uh, been a little difficult, but uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, firstly, I, I want to say um, uh, what a brilliant job the organizers have done. And I, I really um, uh, thank them for uh, putting this on and for Hong Kong for, uh, for, uh, for, for hosting it. I'm going to do uh, four things. First of all, I'm going to look at some of these issues from the perspective of courts that's my perspective. And uh, I'll say something as well about international commercial courts that are beginning to uh, become a feature of the international commercial landscape. Secondly, I'm going to say something about uh, a Belt and Road. There was uh, a, a, a little bit of discussion about that uh, yesterday, and I'll, I'll say a, a little bit more about it um, uh, this morning. Uh, thirdly, I'll say something about Brexit and fourthly about technology. But let me start, if I, if I may, uh, on a personal note. And um, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Dr. Bernasconi, you uh, began uh, yesterday um, by uh, telling us a little bit about the background of the Hague Conference and um, the great jurist, Dutch jurist, Tobias Atta. Uh, and uh, you remember that Chief Justice Ma uh, mentioned um, Tobias Asser as well in his remarks. Uh, I want to uh, mention another Tobias Asser who, in fact, I, I knew very well and was uh, very proud to um, call a colleague, uh, Tobias M. C. Asser, who was the grandson of the uh, great, um, uh, the great man. Uh, he uh, was, uh, when I knew him and worked with him, a distinguished assistant general counsel to the International Monetary Fund. And one of the things we um, did together uh, in the early 1990s was uh, to come to China uh, where the uh, PRC was then working on its first um, revisions to its central banking laws and uh, we played a, a, a modest part in that uh, and of course a, a, a huge amount has been um, done since uh, but uh, uh, I want to dedicate these short remarks to um, Tobias M.C. Uh, Asser if I may. So international commercial uh, courts, uh, the London court where I um, was judge in charge until recently, for our most recent statistics, 70% of the cases in the court are international, um, that is to say uh, non-UK disputes. And not surprisingly, this kind of um, success has uh, um, uh, prompted many other jurisdictions to uh, seek to see whether uh, they too can make a contribution in, the, in this field. And let, let me just uh, say, say that, uh, of course, um, Hong Kong uh, is a, um, a, a world center for uh, global um, financial and commercial dispute resolution. The jurisdictions I'd, I'd mentioned are Singapore with the Singapore International Commercial Court, uh, Dubai was something similar, uh, Doha was something, something similar, uh, for those of us who come from Europe, uh, an English-speaking court in um, uh, Amsterdam is uh, about to um, open. Uh, and um, in China, uh, the reports are of the establishment of an international commercial court or court linked to Belt and Road. And just a, a few weeks ago, there was um, uh, news of the establishment of uh, 
uh, an international financial court in Shanghai, and that could be a very significant um, development as well. Uh, I would say, um, from the point of view of a, a, pra a practicing judge, that um, barely a day goes by without reference to um, private international law in one form or another. Of course, there's jurisdiction, and uh, the Hague Cho uh, Choice of Court Convention. Uh, um, Professor um, uh, Albanos has just uh, um, drawn attention to that, and I know David Goddard is going to be saying more about that in a moment. Proof of foreign law is a very important part of our work. But then you get to enforcement. And um, enforcement is important from the perspective of courts. Not so much because it's part of our our day-to-day -day judicial work, because it's not really. Um, we're engaging as courts with ongoing disputes. We're, we're there to resolve the disputes, and um, enforcement is further down the line. But for the success of a, uh, an international commercial court, or perhaps you might say any court, enforcement is a a key issue. And uh, here, um, the work on the judgments project, which I, kn I know you're going to talk more about, is of huge interest to us. It, it's um, uh, potentially of, of huge interest internationally. And uh, this is um, so something that's unique to the Hague Conference. Perhaps I could also mention uh, the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts, which first met in London last May. It's meeting again in New York in September. And it has enforcement right at the top of its agenda. And we're hoping very much that, um, by the way, that Dr. Bernasconi, you can uh, work your schedule so that you're going to be able to come and, and join us on that event. So uh, let me turn then briefly to Belt and Road. And um, this was mentioned, of course, by Commissioner Xi uh, yesterday morning. The two things really about Belt and Road to um, understand uh, that drive the um, legal uh, analysis as well is firstly, um, the scale of Belt and Road, and, and secondly, um, the number of countries that will be involved in it. And a lot of work has been done, including here in Hong Kong, on um, the subject of dispute resolution. And uh, some of that work is simply engaged in, in trying to um, work out uh, what the legal rules are in countries uh, down the, um, the, the various paths of the Belt and Road. But also, there's a great deal of work that's going on on dispute resolution. And it's, it's quite possible, I think, that um, distinct uh, dispute resolution methods will be devised. And uh, here, the, the Hague Conference has uh, potentially at least an uh, important contribution to make. On Brexit, let me uh, just say briefly uh, that um, Brexit is an individual country's choice. Uh, the European Union as a whole has been hugely successful, uh, and uh, this success will continue. So far as Britain is concerned, there are three points to make for private international law purposes. The first is that leaving the European Union will have no effect on English commercial law. This is because EU law is largely public law. So the choice of English law in many um, international contracts and so on will be entirely unaffected. Secondly, uh, leaving the EU will have no effect on English choice of law rules. And this is because the rules in the Rome Convention that you remember were discussed yesterday um, by various of the speakers will simply be incorporated into English domestic law. They, they're good rules, um, they're sensible rules, uh, and they work well and we'll adopt them. <clears throat> well, I think leaving the EU, EU will have a, a potential impact is in, on the provisions for the enforcement which again, as speakers mentioned yesterday, is presently subject to EU rules and the Brussels regulation. And it's here, I think, that the uh, choice of court convention um, already, already ratified by the uh, European Union uh, will, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom will <coughs> ratify that individually. Um, but the judgments project, of course, is a, a far more um, uh, ambitious project and uh, that, that is something that um, uh, will be very important for the, uh, for the future, as I've said. 
Finally, on technology, I'm not going to say uh, a great deal about this because I know that Professor Gassi Martin is going to deal with this, but <clears throat> I wanted to uh, mention uh, a report published by the Financial Markets Law Committee in March of this year on the subject of distributed ledger technology and governing law. And uh, just to um, pick up a, a point which uh, Professor Bazado made yesterday, um, I think he, he uh, made the point that um, uh, party autonomy is not necessarily uh, g going to be um, adequate to deal with proprietary matters that arise out of um, transactions. And of course, this is uh, potentially equally, too, equally true with um, uh, uh, new, new technologies such as uh, uh, the distributed ledger um, uh, te technology. And this is going to be potentially very important for commerce and finance in, in the future. The, I, I don't want to go into the details now because there's not time, but um, the Financial Markets Law Committee uh, adopted um, as its preferred approach something which it called uh, elective CITES. And essentially what it sought, sought to, to do was to draw the, um, the, uh, the analogy, which we're all very well aware of, uh, between the importance of CITES in uh, um, private inter international law in establishing proprietary interests, but together with um, the uh, possibility of eff eff effectively applying the um, ch uh, choice of law to the uh, particular DLT system. Now, this would probably, uh, this might not work for so called permissionless systems, but it could well work for the kind of permissioned systems that um, are going to, uh, are going to uh, I, I, I think, uh, perhaps relatively soon be used for things like securities transfers. Now, the point I, I, I want to end on, but it's very important, uh, is that um, the Financial Markets Law Committee specifically advocates that um, guideline, uh, model guidelines are uh, adopted by the Hague Conference uh, and um, uh, 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 th this, I think, may be one of the pointers to the future that we want to discuss tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that, I think, leads very neatly and seamlessly to Professor Garcia Matan. Shall I have the here? Okay. Um. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and congratulations to the organizers of this uh, conference. Uh, well, as uh, uh, has been said, I'm going to talk about blockchains. I'm going to say something about blockchains. I will try to be very brief uh, on this. The three main ideas uh, I want to um, explain in my presentation can be summarized as follows. Blockchain is a new technological tool that will probably change the way we are trading now uh, in, in between countries. It is a very efficient and effective mechanism to register and transfer legal entitlements. Uh, it has been said that the disrupted uh, uh, technology introduced by internet was the transfer of information. It, makes, it facilitates the transfer of information, whereas the disruptive technology introduced by blockchain or DLT is that it will facilitate the transfer of uh, assets uh, all around the world. By its own nature, blockchain or DLT is a global technology. It, it links participants in many different countries, and therefore it raises conflict of laws problems, conflict of laws uh, issues. And, and so uh, I think that this uh, technology and the conflict of laws issue that this technology uh, is going to give rise uh, to should be within the agenda, within the radar of the Hague Conference for the uh, coming year. Just very briefly to explain how blockchain works, I'm going to free write on a, a video. Uh, it's just three minutes. Uh, there are many videos out there explaining how blockchain works. Most of them deals with the technological aspect, but I think this video is very useful, at least from a legal perspective. I think it's a very uh, lawyer-friendly issue. Let's see if it works. And if not, I mean, probably forget about blockchain. <laughs> 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 and let's go back to the traditional world. For most physical things, ownership is obvious. When someone gives you a camera, it becomes yours. But ownership of other things may not be so.
so easy to manage. Think about owning land, for instance. You could own a plot of land fair and square, but your ownership isn't obvious. Someone could come along and try to build a house on it without knowing it's yours. In the real world, authorities like banks and governments account for ownership and help prevent these kinds of problems. But this can be a risk too. Think about it this way. Imagine a small village with eight plots of land. When property is bought or sold, the village government accounts for who owns what. This worked for years, but then something terrible happened. Lightning struck the government building and burned it to the ground, along with all the records. Suddenly, ownership of property was unclear, and villagers could claim to own property they didn't. It was chaos. Today, our system is similar. A central authority like a company, bank, or government accounts for ownership. They help us establish and protect what we own and account for it when ownership changes. While this system has worked for years, the internet has enabled a completely new way to think about ownership called blockchain. To understand it, let's consider our village again. When the government building burned down, the villagers saw another opportunity. Instead of having a central authority manage ownership, what if they all managed ownership together in a decentralized system? Once they figured out who owned what, they created a list with everyone's name and the property they owned. This list was the heart of the system and was shared with everyone in the village who each kept their own copy secure. When ownership needed to change in the village, the villagers could verify ownership and approve the transaction by confirming that the seller owned the property. Once the transaction occurred, everyone's list updated automatically. Over time, a record of all these transactions were organized and sealed into blocks that were all linked together and represented a complete and public history that couldn't be changed. This was the village's blockchain. Using this method, ownership was obvious and transparent to everyone. The villagers didn't need a central authority and didn't have the risk of records disappearing or being manipulated. This is the basic idea of blockchain, which many people know through the digital currency Bitcoin. In the online world, it means that a huge network of independent computers all keep an identical list or ledger of who owns what. When ownership changes, whether it's currency, land, or intellectual property, the lists are all updated simultaneously with each new transaction. Like the village, these transactions are organized into a chain of blocks that provide a way to verify ownership today and for every transaction in the past. Blockchain is very complicated and still developing, but could become a fundamentally new way to manage and account for changes in ownership. Like our villagers, we can see whole systems move to using a form of this idea in the future. So blockchain is very complicated. I would say this is referring to the technical part of, all, of blockchain. I don't think that with regard to the transactional part, the institutional part of, of blockchain is really so complicated. This is a definition of how blockchain works from a more transactional perspective. It's taken from Ethereum, which is the big, big, big platform uh, that provides these uh, services. But I am going to use a different example uh, just for you to visualize how, from a tra transactional perspective, this new technology works. Let's assume that I want to transfer my securities in a Japanese uh, company to David in New Zealand. I'm in Spain, he's in New Zealand, and I want to transfer my securities. Yeah. And the, the <laughs> <laughs> Let, depends how. <laughs> uh, and the, the current system, uh, the transaction uh, uh, works as follows. I go to my intermediary, and I ask my intermediary to David those securities from my securities account. Then my intermediary goes to the opportunity intermediary, which is a global custodian, for example, incorporated in, in, in Belgium. And the global custodian debited my securities from uh, that securities account. Then my, the global custodian goes to the Japanese CSD, the uh, issuer CSD, where they are, securities are origin, originally registered. The original CSD debited the securities in that securities account. Then the securities must be credited to the uh, Davis Intermediary Global Custodian, for example, in Singapore. And finally, the securities are credited to Davis' account in New Zealand in his intermediary. Thanks, Parker. To carry other <laughs> transactions. Now you have to pay me. 
<laughs> so uh, if you look at this, uh, you realize that we have at least five intermediaries, and this is a simplified example. We probably need more than five. And there are at least six transactions, debits uh, and credits. The way blockchain simplifies this approach is uh, uh, very easy to say. In a blockchain, there is no central authority. There is no intermediary. We don't need intermediaries. We don't need to trust intermediaries. We just need the change and the, the, the ledger where the transactions are registered. So in this new world, if I want to transfer my securities to David, I just communicate the transaction to the system, which implies I want to transfer yeah. these securities to David. The rest of the members of the system just validate that transaction, i.e. they just check that I am the owner of those securities, and to check that they look at the past and uh, verify all the uh, transactions, transactions before I get the securities. They check that I am the owner. They check that I want to transfer those securities to David, and they check that David wants to accept that securities. In the current world, that uh, transfer may take three or four days. In this new world, it takes only 10 minutes, and the way uh, uh, Ethereum is working, it provides that in 10 minutes uh, the transaction can be verified and automatically, once the trans transaction has been verified, is incorporated to the blockchain and automatically all the uh, registers in all the participants of the block are um, uh, updated and they incorporate this new transaction. So if you look here, you realize the block that blockchain is based on three main elements. It's a ledger mechanism, it's a bookkeeping on a record system, it's a database, it's decentralized, it's not managed by a central authority, it's not managed by an intermediary, it's decentralized in the sense that it is uh, replicated, the ledger, in all the uh, computers of uh, the members of the system, and it is secure in the sense that uh, technologically it's possible to ensure that the, trans the, the securities I transfer to David were my securities. There is no possibility of double transfer. There is no possibility of uh, acquire of uh, uh, these securities by a party from somebody who is not really the owner. Therefore, it's a system that provides uh, effective uh, efficiency and also uh, guarantees about the entitlement of uh, those securities. So this is basically how it works. Now, inter uh, blockchain, uh, the problem is whether um, blockchain will be legally recognized or not. And I just want to refer to the French case. France, in December 19, uh, 2016, I mean December last year, they changed the law and they modified their commercial code and the uh, monetary and uh, securities code. And they now recognize explicitly that securities, shares, or bonds that are not listed. So if they are listed, they don't be represented by blockchain. But if they are not listed, they explicitly recognize in a, a, a paragraph 228 one of the commercial code that securities could be represented either by book entry securities, as in the traditional world, or by a DLT mechanism, by a, 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 a blockchain mechanism. The, the translation into the French is not very, probably, Attractive is dispositif d'enregistrement électronique partagé, but uh, uh, it's blockchain. Basically, they have also modified their um, uh, monetary and securities code just to incorporate also the possibility of registering securities in blockchain and transferring securities through a blockchain mechanism. And they have just simplified uh, the rules saying that uh, the transfer through a blockchain mechanism has the same effects as the transfer of securities through a book entry uh, mechanism. The second idea, um, uh, is, is not going to take much time, is very evident. Blockchain is global. In a system like this, the parties could be uh, anywhere in the world. I mean, I can transfer securities from Spain to New Zealand. I can transfer securities from Spain uh, to Hong Kong. The participants could be anywhere in the world. And the securities are everywhere. So we cannot say that the securities are in Spain, the securities are in New Zealand, or the securities are uh, in Hong Kong. Because the securities are registered in the ledger, and the ledger is completely decentralized. The ledger is kept in the computers or all participants in that system at the same time. So since uh, this is a global, by the, its own nature, it's a global uh, technology, 
automatically will re give rise to conflict of laws issues. And I just want to mention a couple of papers that have been produced uh, so far on this problem. One has been produced by ESMA, the uh, European Securities Market Authority, uh, working on uh, the paper elaborates on DLT technology and the impact of DLT technology in securities market. And one of the main points uh, raised by ESMA is precisely the conflict of law is issue. Uh, ESMA uh, draw the attention to the fact that in the future, uh, if blockchain is incorporated uh, in, uh, as a way to transfer securities, uh, one of the main difficulties would be to determine which law applies to uh, this system, to this uh, 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 mechanism and to the entitlements incorporated in, in that mechanis mechanism. And also I'd like to draw the attention to the paper prepared, uh, has been referred by the former intervention, prepared by the Financial Market Law uh, Group, which is a group of experts seated in, in London. And it explicitly says that the paper focuses on the conflict of laws issue raised by blockchain, which is uh, distributed distributed ledger technology and governing law, issues of legal uncertainty. And one of the main points of the paper says that one need to recognize the increasing, increasing relevance of DLT, distributed ledger technology, and the pressing need for international consensus on the issue of governing law. So um, if we try to incorporate blockchain, and probably will, uh, uh, issues are starting, to, are starting to, to do it, this, uh, the conflict of law aspect will be one of the main uh, issues. Uh, there are different proposals so far in, the, in the, this proposal of the Financial Markets Law uh, uh, Group or committee. They s clearly say that the traditional private international law rules uh, don't work in this system. The less raised situs is uh, uh, not a very useful mechanism because it's based on a physical location of the asset. And in, in this new system, there's no physical location of the asset or the asset is physically located in many countries at the same time. The, Prima rule doesn't work either because it's based on the idea of an intermediary, of intermediation, and, and precisely the main purpose of blockchains is to do away uh, uh, of uh, intermediating uh, uh, parties. And then we have to look for new conflict of law rules. In the French proposal, originally contained a conflict of law rules based precisely in party autonomy. It says that the French law uh, uh, governing blockchain apply as the parties as long as the issuer Choose, uh, chooses French law, the parties chooses French law, so probably parties autonomy will be one solution to the problem, but uh, 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 probably it's not the only, the, the only solution. So, and just to conclude, uh, um, I think it's important to pay attention to this new world because um, experts, it's not me, but experts say that will change the way we uh, uh, trade in the future. And there are already different initiatives working on the uh, legal problems uh, that blockchain may give rise to, and in particular to the private international law, international law problems that uh, this new technology will give rise to. And uh, if the Hague Conference, uh, as we all agree, is probably the institution of reference in this world, I think that uh, blockchain should be within the radar, of the, within the agenda of the uh, Hague Conference in the coming year, and I think this is uh, analyzing the problems, uh, private international law problems raised by blockchains is something that the Hague Conference can, cannot miss uh, out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as you will see, this is the panel which takes you to the cutting edge of technology. Um, perhaps on rather firmer and more traditional ground, we can turn to David Goddard. I think inspired by the example, uh, uh, the experiences with the microphone of others, I, I, I'll use this one. The other reasons for uh, me to... Uh, no, no, not at all. Uh, uh, th th there are two other reasons for me to speak from here. One is that in my day job, I'm a barrister. I'm used to talking, standing up. And the other is that whenever you pick up a handheld microphone, there's this terrible temptation to launch into some really bad karaoke. Uh, uh, and it's really not in anyone's interest that I should sing. Uh, so I think to have a nice fixed microphone, a lectern, it reminds me what I'm supposed to be doing. We're on uh, safer territory. Uh, 
I want to wind back our focus from the 6,500-odd weeks that Christoph uh, uh, talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, the uh, incipient controversy about the calculation has been resolved uh, by a discovery that we were calculating different things. Uh, so all is harmony, as you'd hope, uh, uh, at this conference. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to focus on the next uh, 64 or so weeks. Uh, because that's the time frame within which we hope to conclude uh, the current phase of the judgments uh, project. Uh, we've heard some uh, observations from uh, 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 Jürgen uh, Basto yesterday uh, about uh, the challenges uh, facing the development uh, of a general instrument on recognition and enforcement of judgments. And Sir William uh, described it this morning as an ambitious uh, uh, project. I don't think he's been alone in that either. There was a similar note struck by Lord Collins uh, yesterday. Uh, this, uh, these challenges, uh, this ambitious project, um, uh, not just uh, an interesting academic issue uh, from my perspective, uh, because uh, I face uh, the practical uh, challenge slash opportunity um, uh, of chairing uh, the process uh, and working with many of the people in this room uh, and others uh, to bring it to a successful uh, conclusion. Uh, and uh, I face the difficult challenge of making calls on whether or not there is consensus on certain matters since we don't yet have AI to do it for us. Uh, uh, Christoph, you have no idea how much I yearn uh, for that. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, yep, yeah, haven't yet been replaced by an AI chair. I, I have to do it myself. So what I'm going to do is launch into a quick overview uh, of the interface between the Choice of Court Convention and the proposed uh, Judgments Convention. And then I'm going to identify a couple of questions which I hope, uh, uh, subject to the control uh, of our moderator, uh, you might uh, help me with uh, uh, later uh, in the session. It's time, I thought, to turn the tables and have us put questions to you. Um, so let's see how we do that. Before I launch into it, though, I should just add uh, my voice uh, to those who uh, have said what a delight it is to be here, what a privilege to be invited to attend uh, and speak. I'm very grateful to the Hague Conference, to those who have organized uh, so very effectively uh, this conference, and to our hosts uh, from the uh, 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 government of the Hong Kong uh, SAR. Uh, uh, it's uh, a, a real pleasure uh, to be uh, here today. Oh, I'd also like to thank Paco for those Japanese securities. Uh, uh, depending on their value, which I have yet to check on the blockchain, um, I, I may or may not be back. Um, uh, so I've got some slides. Uh, I prepared these, and then, uh, like many others, I became anxious about what this Davos-style uh, instruction meant, and I looked it up online, and the source I went to said a Davos-style presentation is one where you don't have PowerPoint slides or handwritten notes. Uh, but by then, they'd come into existence, and I'm going to see if I can, yeah, uh, make uh, use of them, though hopefully not in an oppressive uh, way. Um, what are we trying to do? And when I talk about the objectives of the Judgments Project, I'm actually talking about the objectives of the wider Judgments uh, Project, uh, the one that some people have been working on for the last 25 years um, uh, and that I have been involved with for almost uh, 20. Uh, and uh, they are really, I think, twofold, uh, enhancing access to justice uh, and facilitating cross-border trade and investment by reducing uh, the costs and risks associated with cross-border dealings. Two quick points about that. Uh, the first is that when we talk about enhancing access to justice, I think it's important to remember that what we're talking about is practical justice. Uh, and that requires two things. It requires finding a court to hear the case, obviously, but it also requires that one be able to enforce the resulting judgment. Uh, access uh, to a sealed piece of paper uh, is not a very exciting uh, or useful thing. Access to a judgment you can enforce 
uh, wherever the defendant may be, wherever the defendant's assets may be, is the key. So recognition and enforcement of judgments is an integral part of access to justice. I think it's important to bear that in mind. The trade and investment uh, point uh, ties in obviously to this panel in particular. The point I wanted to make about both of these really is what we're focusing on here is the interest of stakeholders, uh, not so much the interests of states. It's a point that was made in a number of sessions yesterday and today that what we're focused on is stakeholders, participants in cross-border disputes, participants in cross-border transactions meeting their needs. I don't think it's helpful to think about um, the judgments project in terms of, you know, we'll enforce your judgments if you'll enforce uh, ours. Rather, it seems to me the interest of states uh, is in protecting the interests uh, of their citizens and of their businesses in obtaining access to justice wherever the most appropriate forum may be and in reducing the risks and costs of their cross-border dealings uh, wherever uh, it may be that they agree to have their disputes resolved uh, or that their disputes ended up being resolved. So we need to move beyond, uh, I think, uh, too narrow a focus uh, on the interests uh, we're protecting uh, here. That said, choice of court convention. Ms. Lee's already talked about this, so I won't spend much time on it. Uh, in the best traditions of the legal profession, I have put far too many words on this slide. Uh, uh, people who are experts in presentation really despair of lawyers, uh, and I am not the worst offender I've ever come across, but I'm quite bad. So <laughs> this is the whole of the architecture of the choice of court convention squeezed into one page. Um, concerned with exclusive choice of court agreements that designate a court or courts of a contracting state, uh, conceived of roughly, loosely speaking, as a court-based equivalent of the New York Convention, to give parties the option of achieving an equivalent level of certainty, uh, predictability, enforceability, if they prefer to have their disputes resolved by a court uh, rather than by an arbitral uh, uh, tribunal, has three key elements. The chosen court must decide the dispute the non-chosen court must give way to the chosen court, and the judgment of the chosen court will be recognized and enforced in other contracting states. Uh, there are limited grounds for refusing uh, recognition and enforcement, as Ms. Hattie said. Uh, importantly, uh, and this is perhaps especially important for common lawyers to bear in mind, there's a presumption of exclusivity uh, where a court is designated uh, in a choice of court uh, agreement uh, in the absence of provision uh, to the contrary. It's a bit of a shift in the way we've often thought of how choice of court agreements work. Uh, there's an optional declaration regime to extend recognition and enforcement to judgments given by a court designated in a non-exclusive uh, agreement. Uh, that's Article 22. It's very limited. Um, uh, the Court of Origin must have been the court first seized, and at the time of enforcement, there must not be a judgment from any other court that could have heard the case consistent with the clause. There must not be any proceedings pending before a court that can hear the dispute consistent with the clause. So there are lots of opportunities to frustrate uh, and uh, hinder uh, enforcement if this mechanism were to be used. Uh, I should also say that none of the um, uh, participants uh, in the convention to date have chosen to make this declaration. Uh, so it also, another uh, point to flag about it is that it hasn't been wildly popular. Um, and importantly, the convention doesn't restrict or limit in any way the recognition or enforcement of judgments under national law. So this was the first of a number of what was envisaged as a, potentially a series of projects arising out of the initial work on recognition and enforcement of judgments done in The Hague in the 1990s and early 2000s. Once we'd completed that, we thought, where next? And the proposal that emerged from that, uh, from working group, uh, was that we would look at a simple convention concerned solely with recognition and enforcement of judgments, not with questions of jurisdiction at all. And We've been working away on that. We've had an expert group. We've had a working group. We've had uh, several meetings of a special commission. We're about to have one more special commission meeting in May. And then there is a commitment to go to a diplomatic conference in the middle of next year. And that's my 64 weeks. 
64 weeks from now, there will be a judgments convention. My work will be done. I will be living somewhere, you know, attractive off the proceeds of the Japanese securities. Uh, uh, and occasionally when people ask me what I used to do before I retired, I'll say, oh, I shepherded the judgments convention. Uh, uh, and they'll say, oh, what? Anyway. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah. So <laughs> as claims to fame go um, on the Cote d'Azur, I'm not sure it will be the greatest, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Anyway, it will be done, 64 weeks. Um, provides recognition and enforcement of judgments. There are no provisions in relation to direct jurisdiction. It's facilitative. It sets a floor for recognition and enforcement, a minimum that contracting states must commit to. National law can provide for more extensive recognition and enforcement of judgments. It's a very important part of the architecture of what we're doing. It's a floor. There are a couple of exceptions to that in Article 6. There is a prohibition on enforcement under the Convention or national law relating to judgments on certain matters that are widely seen as appropriate subjects of exclusive jurisdiction to prevent recognition and enforcement under other heads like defendants, habitual residents. Uh, and those are, uh, and, national, uh, and they, they are certain IP and immovable property matters. We don't need to get into the details now. Um, grounds for recognition and enforcement. This is one of the things I want to just slow down a little bit on and pause on uh, because I'm going to ask a question about it later. Um, uh, and because it's very important to the topic of this panel, uh, international uh, commerce, international finance. Uh, the grounds for recognition and enforcement in the current draft include designation of the court of origin in a non-exclusive choice of court agreement and designation of the court of origin in a trust instrument. There are limited grounds for refusal, uh, which uh, uh, parallel choice of court plus a couple of extras that are required uh, 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 um, uh, participants uh, have felt in this context. Uh, one, uh, which again I'm going to come back to, is where the proceedings in the court of origin were contrary to an agreement or a designation in a trust instrument which provided for the dispute to be determined in another court. The other ground for refusal that I should mention, uh, because I'm going to come back to it, especially in light of Jürgen's uh, 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 paper yesterday, um, is uh, the public policy uh, exception, uh, as uh, in choice of court, what you've got um, uh, is uh, permission uh, to the uh, court address, to the state address, to refuse recognition or enforcement. If it would be manifestly incompatible with the public policy of the requested state, including situations where the specific proceedings leading to the judgment were incompatible with fundamental principles of procedural fairness of that state. Uh, and situations involving infringements of security or sovereignty. But I want to pause on the manifestly incompatible with public policy, including incompatibility with fundamental principles of procedural fairness, because I want to come back to one of the key challenges that Jürgen identified and ask whether we need more than that, and if so, what that more <laughs> might be. Very important practical question we're going to need to get our heads around in the next 64 weeks. Um, it's very helpful to keep mentioning the deadline, I find. It concentrates people's attention. <laughs> um, uh, and then just to make sure that the... Um, it's important also to bear in mind the relationship between the convention and the arbitration proceedings uh, because uh, the whole point is not to cut across uh, developed jurisprudence in relation to arbitration. It doesn't affect grants of stay uh, and doesn't affect national law on refusing recognition or enforcement where proceedings in the court of origin were inconsistent with an arbitration agreement. Um, they were just not intending to go there. So what's the relationship between the two instruments? They're complementary. I've described them before as sister conventions. The expectation is that states will become parties to both and that they'll operate in tandem. They're consistent as they currently stand, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, 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 one of the important things for us to bear in mind as we work on the draft judgments instrument will be to maintain that consistency. Um, uh, we, uh, and uh, importantly, uh, the only uh, matters uh, where there's a prohibition on recognition or enforcement on another basis, outside choice of, uh, 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 in the judgments convention, are outside the scope of choice of court. So there's no uh, clash uh, 
uh, there. Um, there's an obvious overlap with the optional declaration regime in choice of court in relation to non-exclusive choice of court agreements. I think the reality is uh, that uh, if the final judgments convention, uh, the one that will be adopted within 64 weeks, um, <laughs> uh, contains uh, the non-exclusive uh, agreement uh, ground for recognition and enforcement, uh, then it will supersede. Uh, the um, optional declaration regime, uh, because it uh, is, I think, uh, more flexible, more, ta or more tailored uh, to the situation. The optional declaration regime happened in a bit of a rush uh, towards the end of the choice of court process, uh, and it's not a thing of beauty. Uh, it has a couple of problems. And so I think it will, if we include non-exclusive agreements and judgments, slide into um, uh, uh, an obscurity which some might think uh, was deserved. Uh, otherwise, we have to do the best we can. I want to emphasize uh, the importance of the new project, of the judgments project, for our topic here today, international financial transactions, uh, really for two reasons. The first is that it's very common in international finance agreements to see asymmetric jurisdiction clauses. Um, uh, or very sophisticated jurisdiction clauses uh, that uh, allocate jurisdiction uh, to more than one court uh, in different situations. That means they're not exclusive, which means choice of court doesn't apply. So if we want the benefits of predictability, certainty of recognition and enforcement in, uh, for, of a judgment from one of the designated courts, uh, uh, this uh, project uh, needs to deliver that. Um, uh, and finally, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, just for the sake of completeness, that there's also a proposal to do some future work on jurisdiction that's currently with an expert group, which will meet again after the work on judgments has been concluded. But I don't think we've got time really to talk too much about that today. So that is what I wanted to run through really very fast. I'm sorry about that, but many of you know this well anyway. And that means I can move on to my questions. I can he seek help from you. First question, is it important, actually let's go back, is it important to have in the judgments instrument the non-exclusive choice of court agreement ground for recognition and enforcement? Is this a high priority? Second, is it appropriate to have as an optional ground for declining recognition and enforcement that proceedings in the court of origin were contrary to a choice of court agreement. Uh, and third, third, uh, and perhaps most challengingly, uh, arising out of Jürgen's uh, comments the other day and some proposals that have already been discussed um, uh, 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 at a special uh, commission, we've got this concern uh, that's been expressed in the room and it's been expressed in the corridors outside the room uh, about uh, universal recognition and enforcement by every contracting state of judgments from every other contracting state, even where that other contracting state, the state of origin, has a, what one might describe as a fragile, in some respects, uh, judicial system or where concerns, uh, rightly or wrongly, have been raised uh, about those judicial uh, institutions. So how do we deal with those concerns? Is the public policy exception sufficient? Many think it is. Uh, that what you can do is look on a case-by-case -case basis at whether those concerns arise. Uh, and people point out, I think with some force, uh, that even uh, fragile uh, institutions uh, are still capable of getting many decisions right. Um, uh, I've uh, uh, in a range of courts in small jurisdictions around the world, uh, in at least one case shortly after a military coup, uh, and there was certainly room for concern about the operation of the courts in some areas, but not so much in relation to ordinary civil litigation. So do we need a global uh, rule on this, or can we worry proceeding by proceeding about what's happening? Or do we run with Jürgen's idea that uh, when you uh, accede 
to the Judgments Convention, you should make a positive declaration of the states whose judgments you'll recognize and enforce. Uh, the possibility of a negative declaration has been identified. Uh, it's, uh, the concern is that if you say, accept, you know, we'll accept everyone's judgments except state X, uh, that that's a very difficult thing to say. And Jürgen's gesturing at me, no, we can't do that. But can I just say, Jürgen, that most people can count. I was worried for a while that Christoph couldn't, turns out he can. Uh, uh, but most people can count. And if you have 30 contracting states and you declare that you will recognize and enforce the judgments from 29, people can tell that one is missing. And they can work their way through the list and work out which it is. So it's a slightly more palatable way of basically doing exactly the same thing. Is it going to work? Will states be willing to go there or will it all be too hard? There's then the bilateralization approach of the old Hague judgments instrument. No one seems to think uh, that's a good idea just because of practical workability issues. So what should we do? How can we address this challenge? Is public policy enough? Or do we need to do something else? And if so, what? Help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should just make a, uh, an organizational intervention um, and say that because of the uh, uh, advanced technology of a note that has passed between me uh, and Thomas, um, I've been given some extra time for this panel, uh, so we will have some time for questions, notwithstanding the fact that we uh, still have two speakers to go. Um, I wonder, um, in that case, um, if following the order on the um, sheet, I can, I can now move to Jose. Thank you very much, and congratulations for organizing this really warm gathering, and also very enriching. The Hague Conference and Choice of Law and International Contracts have an enormous potential to promote cross-border economic activity in multi-jurisdictional settings. This brief presentation will focus on the circumstances of their enactment in the work of promotion and implementation that lies ahead. Countless transactions flow daily boosting worldwide commerce through international contracting. A central issue regarding them relates to applicable law. Inconceivably, this matter lacks appropriate regulation. Only Europe has managed to generate a regional document. The Americas, in turn, proposed in recent decades a praised regulation which failed in attracting a substantial number of ratifying countries. The situation worsens in other regions where no initiatives have come to fruition. This scenario can change dramatically after the approval in 2015 of an instrument on the matter advanced by the Hague Conference. Created in 1893, more than 100 years would pass before this global organization would address the issue of choice of law in international contracts. In the meantime, the Americas took the lead. The Montevideo Treaties of 1889 and 1940, ratified by South, some South American countries, dealt with the matter. Many other states on the continent did not incorporate the Montevideo Treaties, but instead ratified the so-called Bustamante Code of 1928. By the mid-20th century, there was a general feeling that the above mentioned documents adopted in the Americas were highly unsatisfactory. Firstly, due to the questionable solutions they proposed, and secondly, because of the divergences among them. To make matters worse, several states on the continent had not ratified any of these instruments, notably from the common law world. Establishment of the Organization of American States, OAS, in 1948 Spawn firm hopes that the situation would finally be resolved. However, it was not until 1994 that the issue of choice of law in international contracts was addressed. The resulting instrument is commonly known as the Mexico Convention. Even though it was welcomed by relevant legal scholars, the Mexico Convention has so far only been ratified by Mexico and Venezuela. Speculation is rife as to why the convention has not been adopted by more countries. 
Some writers state that the legal establishment in the region was not sufficiently prepared to receive its solutions, or that perhaps there was ignorance of other modalities for its receptions besides ratification. Regarding the latter, an alternative would be, for instance, merely copying its provisions into a national law, as has been done, for instance, in Venezuela. The comparable European instrument on choice of law, known as the Rome Convention of 1980, converted into European regulation in 2008, has enjoyed a different fate. The instrument became relevant not only because of its massive adoption, but also due to its influence in the drafting of the Mexico Convention in the Americas, and more recently, the Hague Principles. In fact, the success of the Rome Convention led the Hague Conference to undertake feasibility studies in the early 1980s regarding the possible adoption of a similar instrument on a global scale. This endeavor was discarded after considering the difficulties of obtaining massive ratification of the eventual document. However, in recent years, the matter was resumed and feasibility studies that took place between 2005 and 2009 indicated that perhaps a different type of instrument could prove successful and effective. Accordingly, a working group was convened in 2010 which advanced the idea that rather than targeting adoption of a treaty or hard law instrument, a soft law document could be developed instead. The Hague principles are limited to choice of law issues, specifically in relation to party autonomy. They are conceived to become relevant as a powerful interpretative tool for arbitrators and judges, as already occurred in a case in Argentina, and of course, a model for legislators. Paraguay pioneered incorporated in solutions in its law and international contracts enforced since January 2015. Its first part regarding choice of law primarily reproduces the Hague principles with minor modifications. The following provisions mostly deal with the applicable law in the absence of choice, replicating almost literally the Mexico Convention of 1994. As expressed by leading commentators, the Paraguay enactment sets a path showing how to actually embody the Hague principles in a national legislative text. So, what's next for the Americas? Will the region insist on the ratification of the Mexico Convention? Should the convention be amended, taking into consideration new developments? Perhaps a model law should be prepared? The latter question has gained particular momentum after the enactment of the new Paraguayan law. Recently, the Inter-American Juridical Committee of the OAS analyzed all these alternatives after circulating a questionnaire to the member states and prominent private international law specialists. Responses reflect the perception that evidently the Hague principles have gone further than the Mexico Convention and its provisions could serve to amend the Inter-American document. However, considering that the instrument, which dates from 1994, has received only two ratifications, the real question is whether a process leading to a new revised convention would be worth the effort, while other kinds of soft law documents have proven to be highly effective means to harmonize solutions. So a model law or a legislative guide may be a good idea, but why just a legislative guide? Why not a guide that could also be useful to judges, arbitrators, contracting parties, academics, and the legal world in general? In response, the Inter-American Juridical Committee is drafting a guide on the applicable law to international contracts, which is expected to receive formal approval next August. This proposal combines the best of all worlds. Firstly, the guide will serve as an instrument that will educate. This is not a minor thing, considering that one of the reasons why the Mexico Convention has met resistance is attributed to misinformation as to its content and implications. Secondly, from a legislative perspective, the guide will serve as a tool that takes into account recent developments enshrined in the Hague Principles, and that also covers matters not addressed therein, but that were regulated in the Mexico Convention, specifically regarding the absence of choice. More than 20 years have passed since the approval of the Inter-American Instrument and, of course, the Hague Principles also incorporated subsequent developments that paved the way for solutions to some new issues. Furthermore, the Hague Principles have been better able to solve some issues that, in the development of the Mexico Convention, 
had been subject to compromise solutions due to the complexity of the negotiations that led to the adoption of a treaty. This is particularly the case regarding uh, non-state law. Thirdly, the guide could be a powerful interpretative tool in the hands of judges, arbitrators, and parties considering the alarming uncertainties that persist in the subject of international contracting. Finally, the guide can take advantage of the fact that UNCITRAL and the Hague Conference are envisaging the drafting of a document explaining the interplay between the UNIDRA principles, the Vienna Convention on Sales, and the Hague principles. References to this interaction will be made in turn at the OAS document. Undoubtedly, the guide can be a powerful tool in promoting the Hague principles not only in the Americas, but also globally. Leading jurists from within and outside the continent have volunteered for its revision and are expected to spread the word and its eventual approval. In turn, UNIDRA, UNCITRAL, and the Hague Conference will probably reference the guide in their eventual joint document. Moreover, their secretariats have kindly accepted to, command, to provide comments on the draft. More globally, the principles are promoted by the Hague Conference by different means. As known, promotion is an important part of the organization's agenda, and recurrent calls insist on its furtherance. For instance, in a recent survey finalized in the first quarter of 2018, the Hague Conference, in cooperation with the American Association of Private International Law, ASADIP, and here's a founding father, Diego, Mr. Professor Arroyo, it has detected as one of the top priorities, this study has, uh, this survey has detected as one of the top priorities the necessity of working on the dissemination of the important work of the global organization. Other actors can bring about key contributions as well. Under the leadership of Professor Daniel Gierseberger, former chair of the working group that drafted the Hague Principles, a project for promoting the principles is underway under the auspices of the Swiss National Foundation. One of the objectives of the, is the drafting of an independent scientific publication at Oxford University Press by experts from all over the world. The outcome will consist of a general report supplemented by various country or regional reports. Also, there will be special reports on the historical and international perspectives, especially those of the most important institutions such as the ICC, the Hague Conference, UNCITRAL, and UNIDRAW. <coughs> to ensure accessibility of the future developments in the field of party autonomy, the construction and permanent maintenance of a specialized database is also envisaged in this Swiss sponsored project. The database should contain relevant text, case law, and doctrine. Furthermore, it should include reports and other contributions, contributions of experts in the field, and the technical infrastructure for all this will be provided by CEDEF of Paraguay. To finalize, beyond promoting party autonomy, the Hague Principles anticipate a future of new ways of contracting and legal rules beyond the border of states. Awareness all around the globe of its potential is key. Hopefully, promotion activities as the ones described and others that may come to fruition will accelerate disseminating its envisioned beneficial effects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we turn to um, our last speaker, Christopher Walker. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you very much to the organisers. I was uh, delighted to be able to accept this last-minute invitation to speak. I had a gap open up in my schedule, and I was able to fly from Sydney this morning or last night to speak today. Um, I'm also very conscious of the time, uh, and I'll reduce my um, comments to a fairly brief um, proposition about the unpredictability of a particular aspect of conflict of laws uh, and private international law. Um, and you'll see that I'm adopting the Davos style in all its glory with neither note nor PowerPoint. Um, the um, one issue that I think has caused more um, anxiety on the part of clients, both large corporations and small individuals, in the 25 years or so that I've been um, advising and advocating at the private bar 
uh, is the lack of party autonomy or the unpredictability of party autonomy in the field of the interaction between contract and the mandatory law of a particular forum. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, um, private international law rightly places great emphasis upon the, uh, the ability of parties to select contract and um, now, uh, more than ever before, also choice of court. But as we move in a more globalised society with clients who are increasingly using the internet for global marketing purposes, we find that um, corporations and sometimes even individuals are coming across laws that they simply had no idea about, laws that apply to them um, without any knowledge. And uh, they can turn the course of litigation, turn the course of a commercial uh, outcome. I just want to have uh, a very brief description of three examples, which I think I can do in four minutes or less. Uh, each of these three examples uh, is based in Australia. That doesn't mean that the proposition and the problem is unique to Australia. It's just a convenient place to start. Um, the first involved a shipping company called CSL Australia. Um, CSL Shipping um, was challenged by the Maritime Union of Australia in relation to its practices uh, with a particular boat. The boat was engaged in international shipping in that it ran um, up the east coast of Australia across to Papua New Guinea, I think back down to New Zealand and then back across to Australia. It was a boat that was registered in the Bahamas. It had a Ukrainian crew on board and they were subject to a Ukrainian employment contract that was governed by the law of the Ukraine. One might think that the shipboard conditions on board that ship would be governed by the law of the Ukraine, um, but the High Court felt differently in a 7 decision. It applied the Workplace Relations Act of Australia, as it then was, to find that uh, the wages and other conditions on board the ship were in fact governed by Australian law because the vessel was engaged in what's described as the coasting trade. That is, it was passing between two or more, in fact three or more, Australian ports on its way up the east coast of Australia on a regular basis. Now, that's, uh, I could say a lot more about that case, but I'll just lay that there as one example in which the choice of law in contract, contract was completely overridden by a compulsory law of the forum in which the shipping company found itself. One might think that perhaps CSL could have known about that law, uh, given that they were undoubtedly engaged in a, a, an area that did contact Australia, and perhaps they should have had some foresight about the law. Um, I can save their dignity and say they did have some foresight about the law and they ran it as a test case to see what would happen and they were unsuccessful. Um, the next example though is a very recent one. It's a decision of the full federal court in December of last year. It's a case called Valve Corporation against the Australian Consumer and Competition Commission. And Valve Corporation runs a thing which you might have heard of called Steam. Steam is the platform on which a lot of internet games are these days um, disseminated over the internet. So if you want to play Clash of Clans or War of Worlds or some other sorts of games, you um, get an account with Steam and you log on to Steam and you download the game and you pay Steam a fee. Uh, and uh, the Steam server is located in Washington in the United States. It's available worldwide. That is, you type in the Steam in internet address and you um, click the button and you get your game after paying a credit card fee. The standard terms and conditions that you accept when you do that are also governed by the law of Washington and they do not provide for a refund except in very, very limited circumstances. Um, a couple of Australian people were very annoyed with the quality of games that they purchased on the Steam platform, and I don't think they're alone from the number of giggles in the room, uh, and they made a complaint to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission uh, about the fact that no refund had been offered. And they produced records of their communications with Steam in which the standard response of Steam was to say, we do not provide refunds, I'm sorry. Now, the Australian consumer law requires refunds to be given in cases where goods and services are not of essentially merchantable quality. And the um, case was brought against Valve Corporation, which is the owner of Steam, based upon the Australian consumer law, and it succeeded. The total cost of the games in question amounted to about $68 Australian dollars. The total cost of the fine that has been imposed upon Valve Corporation is three million Australian dollars by reason of its wrongdoing. Um, now, Steam is perhaps in a different position to CSL in that Steam has a worldwide platform, a platform available in every country in the world. 
it might not have thought that it was going to be exposed to a $3 million penalty for its no refund policy by reason of the fact that consumers in Australia, a country it may or may not have ever heard of, were um, clicking on its link. And then I'll just give you a th third example before I sit down very briefly, and that's a case involving a Qantas subsidiary called Jetstar, which I think still flies here. It certainly flies around Asia. Um, Jetstar, um, about five or six years ago, uh, created a couple of bases in Asia, in particular in Singapore, and it began flying uh, aircraft from Singapore into Australia and within Australia, and then back to Singapore and other Asian destinations using cabin crew that were employed um, in Singapore and Thailand on contracts of employment governed by Singapore and Thai law. And they were, the cabin crew were exclusively nationals of that place, of whichever country they started in, that is either Singapore or Thailand. And in almost a rerun of the CSL shipping case, uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman, which is the industrial regulator in Australia, the labour law regulator in Australia, prosecuted um, Jetstar for failing to pay Australian award wages to the cabin crew um, entirely. That is not just in relation to the parts of the flights that may have flown in and out of Australia. That case again had employment contracts that were governed by the laws of Singapore and Thailand. Um, and there was a level of connection with Australia in that the aircraft undoubtedly flew within Australia. They flew into the port of Darwin, then down to Melbourne and sometimes back through Brisbane. Uh, and then they went off on further international voyages using the same crew. That case um, was successfully resisted by Jetstar in that the federal court in that case decided that there was no sufficiently close connection to Australia to override what was otherwise the choice of law in the relevant contracts. I simply raise those three anecdotal cases this morning. There's a lot more I could say about the law behind them, but I put it out there um, in this way. Um, the moral of those stories is that party autonomy has limits. And the unpredictability of the limits of that party autonomy is something which I think uh, we all need to still work on, uh, particularly as entities continue to work in this more globalised environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've covered an enormous amount of ground, and I think it would be unnecessary for me, indeed meaningless for me, to attempt to pick out some, some themes. Um, I also think it's important that we should turn to you, the audience, at this point. So without any further gloss, introduction, or summation, I wonder if I can ask, please, for any comments or questions from the audience. Yes. I think first. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going first to the gentleman sitting just here. Well. Hello, I'm Nicholas Meyer from the Swiss Ministry of Justice, and thank you very much for your presentations. Although you're preventing us from lunch, I must say that your contributions are at least worth an entree or a first course. Um, I have a question for Paco and um, David, and it's not about your Japanese transaction. So, uh, Paco, you mentioned the blockchain technology, and you mentioned that there is a need for action, but actually I'm questioning, is there really a need for action? Because Blockchain technology, it may be new, but it's uh, not more revolutionary than emails or the telephone back in the time or even the invention of the horse. Uh, I mean, when contracts were transferred by horse, um, the Romans also had to think about, is this a new challenge? And isn't law technology neutral and actually we don't need um, a new rule about blockchain because it's just a new way of uh, transfer of documents? And then for David, actually, you raised three questions, and I will give one answer to your third question, which is a link to Professor Bazado's comments um, on the, the T word, the trust, which he raised. We never use the word trust. We always talk about a variety of legal systems. And um, from my point of view, I would say, yes, um, we need something more than the public policy uh, because we have to be realistic, and the Judgments Convention will um, address uh, judgments from a broad variety of different legal systems with all their advantages and weaknesses, and I guess we need something such as an accession mechanism where states can say, um, for the moment, um, we prefer not to recognize judgments from certain countries, but we will perhaps do later. And this also could be an enhancement, actually, for these countries to work on their legal system and say, okay, 
Um, we want our judgments to be recognized, what is the problem, and then we can fix this. And I would be very interested to hear from practitioners if they share this concern. Thank you. Yes, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, uh, just very briefly, I think that uh, the main difference between the internet, the telephone, and blockchain is that internet and the telephone facilitate the transfer of information, where, whereas blockchain facilitates the transfer of legal entitlements. So the idea is to transfer assets through a blockchain mechanism. And uh, I do think there is a need of legal intervention, and I just want to, to give you an example. It's a real case in the United Kingdom, uh, and it's a case of uh, an exchange trader that facilitates the exchange between euro and bitcoins. And please be aware that bitcoin is different from blockchain. Blockchain is the technology underlying bitcoins, but the, the, of things of a very different nature. Uh, in this case, the um, uh, exchange house uh, went bankrupt, and the owners of, bo of, blo of bitcoins in that uh, exchange rate ask for the bitcoins. And they just have to address the issue of whether they have a proprietary right or they have a mere contractual right. And what the French legislator has said is that they have a proprietary right. So at least to guarantee that if you have your entitlement represented in a blockchain uh, system, you are the owner of those assets. And you, are, you don't merely have a contractual right, which is very relevant in cases of, of insolvency. So I think that uh, 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 there is a need of, of legal intervention, at least of legal recognition of uh, blockchain as a way of or as a means of registering and transferring uh, assets. So, David. I don't have anything to add. I keep, I, that's a helpful first contribution to the debate. I'm sure there'll be more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question just here in the front, if you could bring the microphone. Thank you. I uh, just have one point about an, an example. I'm talking now from academic side, not as a diplomat or presenter of Saudi Arabia. Just to address important element David just raised here. When you look at the public policy or exclusivity when it comes to arbitration, enforcement, judgment in other jurisdiction, since you based everything in New York Convention, so that's mean you first thing we go to New York Convention, see the signatory state, and then we see what they are restrictions. For example, if you apply Saudi Arabia case, then you will all the time if you have enforcement, you want to enforce in Saudi Arabia. Then that's mean you have to distinguish between the judgment and the enforcement. Then when you move to the second level, you check the public policy, which is national law, and the restriction within that, which is riba which is extortion or extra profit that will not be enforced, then they would look at the absolute right and the judgment, and then they will enforce it. As a, ex a exit policy, let's say, or an another, then you will base it on interest, what you mentioned. Then the interest here, when you come to apply it, for example, as a scenario in Saudi Arabia, you look at the profit and or the game laws, to, you know, the legal gain and all these things, and then you can apply a new instrument, which is insurance. That if you are a contracting company, you want to do a huge contract with Saudi Arabia, then from scratch, you see New York Convention, you see the restrictions, and then you apply your exit policy through as a scenario as insurance contract. You say, look, in case of failing or entering dispute into the arbitration, then you can put it under stabilization clause or anything. Then you say, look, there is insurance contract here for this particular section to be satisfied. Then you have the full ca capacity of re recovery of your judgment as enforcement, one according to the public policy and one according to your conventional you know, platform. And this is like a tip for you for the future negotiations so we don't have to go through this. And for the colleague in the back just mentioned, the most important thing is to respect the other legal system and jurisdiction and application because this is part of the sovereignty. You cannot dismiss other sovereignty and legal system by saying, yeah, they have to follow us. This is, doesn't work in this world. Thank you. Would anyone like to comment on 
Um, in that case, I think we need to go to Professor Bassado, who, who has been mentioned several times this morning and, 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 needs, a, and, needs, and needs a right of reply. I just have two questions. One uh, to uh, Paco Gassimatin. Um, as I understand this blockchain system, it is an open system as compared with the closed system of securities bookings that we have at present or the land registry. Isn't such an open system much more exposed to technical risks, to risks of being attacked from outside? I mean, apart from the eight villagers, there are perhaps many more people who would like to have one of those plots of property and would like to get access to it. Isn't that possible? Second question to Sir William Blair. Um, after Brexit, Will Britain probably, likely, ratify the Hague Securities Convention, which has been disputed within the European Union? So far, it has not been ratified, but the US have ratified it, and Switzerland has ratified it. Also, Saint, uh, Mauritius, I don't know whether they are an important capital market, but the other two are. And uh, so London would, of course, be invited to join them. So, Paco first. Yes, thank you, Jorgen. Uh, I mean, there are two options with regard to blockchain. There is the so-called permission blockchain, which is open to everybody, it's like Bitcoin. There are permissionless blockchain, where it's limited to certain authorized people. In the second example, it's more difficult to, to manipulate the system. But even in the first example, it's extremely difficult to manipulate the system. I'm, I'm not an expert on security, uh, secure transaction in, uh, and cryptographic function, hash function and so on. But basically the idea behind blockchain is that if you want to manipulate the system, you have to uh, cheat, uh, you have to confuse or you have to uh, um, fraud all participants in the system. So in the village example, you have to go to all participants in the system and I say, I'm the owner of the house. The rest of the participants in the system, which is an open system, check whether you are the really owner of the house. And to check that, they read the whole ledger so far and they uh, recall whether you have, uh, from whom you have acquired a house and, and the seller from whom has acquired a house. So you trace back whole chain of transaction from the very beginning and at that moment, they validate, they validate, validate the transaction. And this validation of one transaction by one participant in the system must be uh, checked by the rest of the participant in the system at the same time. So since it's a, a system which is controlled by so-called consensus by all participants in the system, the idea behind that is that it's very difficult to manipulate the whole participant in the system. So it's not enough to manipulate one person. You have to participate in all people who were living in that village to change the trace, the, the ledger of uh, a transaction. So this is uh, what is behind the, the blockchain. An expert, they say, with that with com this combined with hash function, cryptographic function, and so on, is much more difficult to, to manipulate. And, and the best example is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an open blockchain. And there was one case it was uh, tried to be manipulated, and it didn't succeed. So uh, uh, the proof so far is that it is very difficult to manipulate us. Those systems are very difficult to manipulate. Thank you. So, are we going to ratify? Just, just before I get to your question, just on um, blockchain, um, yes, it's difficult to manipulate, but, but um, I think everyone here will uh, recall the um, uh, incident in Tokyo in uh, February, was it, or January, when about half a, half a billion dollars worth of um, a cryptocurrency went, um, went, went missing. And I think the, um, uh, uh, so, so, so there are some pr pretty big questions out there, I think, uh, ab 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 about that. I, I thank you very much for your point about do we need to do it. I was on the um, uh, working group that came up with the um, Financial Markets Law Committee paper that Professor Gassimata mentioned. Um, I, I think uh, for um, securities transfers, yes, it's a, good, it's a good idea to look at it. And, uh, but, I, but I think probably um, your, uh, your, the, the validity of your point is that the technology continues to evolve the whole time. And it may very well be that when, um, if, if and when the Hague Conference takes up the invitation that we gave, that they'll want to um, 
you know, maybe not come up with, try to come up with definite rules at this point in time, but more ask questions than um, try, try to lay down rules. Professor, thank you so much for your question on my least favorite subject. <laughs> uh, I, I, I meant what I said about the um, huge success of the European uh, Union. I think it's very important to make that point. Uh, and I know that um, that's something that the British government has, has said again and again in, um, over the last two years. And uh, it's very important that uh, I should say it. Uh, I think it's more likely in terms of security that securities that um, uh, Britain will go the, will go the e EU route. And rather than um, uh, go, go the Hague Securities Convention route, we'll simply import wholesale into uh, um, uh, UK law, the fi financial collateral rules, settlement finality rules, um, and um, the, the uh, set central depository rules. So I, I, I don't, in fact, see that as particularly likely. Well, thank you very much. We have played well into extra time. So I think I need to blow the final whistle. But perhaps before we do that, you might give the team up here a round of applause for all their hard work. I hope the car is coming for you today. Thank, uh, thank you very, very much for your indulgence, uh, eating well and truly into lunchtime. Um, but I like Nicholas's uh, analogy with the entree, though I do accept it's an intellectual entree, and we're still hungry. So uh, it's now lunchtime, lunch break. Lunch is served downstairs. And uh, looking forward to seeing you back at 2 p.m. Now I'm venturing off and wish you sick fun. I think that's how it is pronounced. I hope I haven't offended anyone. It means just simply enjoy your meal. Thank you. <laughs>